We have compelling to, testimony. And we have to move on. Testimony. Senator Frum. Thank you. Chair. Um, uh, Professor Weisman, I, I, I was struck when you spoke uh, on the issue of the um, poll supervisors that, you know, the same people who say they see no, they, they do not fear any form of fraud in the vouching process and want to maintain vouching as it is, these same people um, are terrified that if we allow the uh, winning party to name a central poll supervisor, then uh, then there will be, <laughs> we will open ourselves up to possible you know, fraud, even though in that case you have the returning officer who's appointed by the chief electoral officer, you have scrutineers operating from all the parties, uh, but that's where a lot of people see an invitation to fraud, but they, they, they cannot see where the invitation exists with vouching. So I just thank you for alerting me to that, that thought. But there's a contradiction in my position, because I'm willing to trust them, the, the poll supervisors of a party I may not care for, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm also apparently not trusting of the voucher. I'm just accepting the government's bill, and I don't think it's that that onerous. No, I'm, I'm saying sorry, I'm saying that there's many more safeguards to having the win, winning party, as you say, it's only 52 percent of the governing party, so it's the winning party. There's many more safeguards for that yeah. individual uh, to do their job properly than there are for vouching. So I'm just saying the people. I mean, if I may say. Uh, I agree Professor with Thomas, that, that, that I don't quite, I don't understand that, and, and I will let you respond to that if you'd like, but I, would Go you ahead, respond no, to that? No, I, I can respond to whatever point you want. I'll, <laughs> the chair is in charge, so I'll, okay. I'll, I'll use okay. my time. Well, I was actually, I, that was more of a comment on my part, which is not perfectly appropriate, but I just, I couldn't help it. Um, I, I really, um, I, I wanted uh, Professor Wiseman to actually uh, thank you for something that you wrote, uh, I don't know how recently it was. In, the, in policy options in 2006 in an article called Get Out the Vote, Not Increasing Effort, Declining Turnout. Uh, when we had uh, Monsieur Mayron here testifying, uh, I asked him if he didn't see that there was a conflict of interest between uh, having the same person administer, be the chief administering a fair election, and also for that person to be uh, an individual incentivized to ensure a, a good voter turnout, that, there, that those two roles contain within them a conflict. And I want to thank you for this article because I think you've expressed it well, and I just want to read something that, a piece of what you wrote, and if you can uh, address this. Uh, the job of Elections Canada ought to be, as it was when turnout was substantially higher, restricted to facilitating and monitoring fair and transparent elections, not to proselytizing for voting. It ought to proclaim that voting is, it, sorry, it ought not to proclaim that voting is important and that it is imperative to participate because it cannot and should not try to back up these claims. It ought not to act as a slick salesman turning to the manipulators and image makers of the advertising industry, a sponsorship scandal like thousands of dollars thrown away in promoting Charlottetown Accord, combating obesity, smoking, promotion of energy conservation, expose the ineffectiveness of government advocacy advertising. And then you say, one of the characteristics of a totalitarian regime in, is its concern for securing a high turnout is to demonstrate its triumphant reach over its subjects. Political apathy can be a sign of resistance to the prevailing political system and its actors. So that to me makes the case for the, the conflict, which I thank you for. And I'm wondering if, if you can just expand or discuss if you, if you <laughs> agree or you could continue to agree with yourself in 2006 that there is a conflict. <laughs> yeah, I'd forgotten I'd written that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's essentially my, my position. I, I, uh, when I grew up, uh, Elections Canada stuck to its knitting, and we had higher turnout. So I, I think the recent turnout has gone down, has very little to do, and, and I don't think the efforts mean very much. There are all kinds of broader cultural reasons, Professor Howe talked about them. Uh, turnout's gone down throughout the Western world. My, I, I have my own sense, uh, anecdotally, among why it's gone down among young people, uh, Pauline Bench talked about it, that now there isn't the same social stigma attached to it. There's a difference in turnout between um, if you're in a rural area, small town, you're more likely to, you know, they're all, uh, to turn out than if you live in a condo where you don't know any of your neighbors. There isn't that same social pressure. There are all kinds of reasons why it goes down. I, to me, democracy <laughs> isn't the number of people that turn out to vote. 
If that's the case, hey, we're doing well compared to the United States. The last congressional elections had 38 percent turnout. I don't know what it was in Afghanistan, but I'm not worried. They're not more democratic because their turnout might have been 70 percent and ours was 61. It, it, because democracy includes deliberation, compromise, um, it, it, courts that are independent, uh, an active civil society, a free press, being able to say what we want to say. And, uh, and one of the reasons maybe voter turnout's gone down, especially among young people, is, well, you know, they're not that stupid. They've got more education than ever. A lot of them realize it may not make much difference who gets elected. I won't agree with you there, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will turn the floor back to the chair. <laughs> uh, Senator Joel. Chair, welcome, Professor. Uh, I may have to uh, declare some kind of a conflict of interest. I've known Professor Thomas and uh, have the benefit of his contribution to a book I edited in 2003, and uh, it was with no strings attached, no money. So uh, I, the royalty stream has dried up. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was on the uh, on the understanding of the institution of the Senate, as Senator Batters has said, is a component of our democratic institution. Um, that being said, I would like to come back to your suggestion 12, uh, Professor Thomas, and maybe Professor Wiseman could comment after that. It's about the, 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 the you mentioned that you, both of you want to drop the proposal to eliminate the use of voter, uh, voter information cards. I think you concur, both of them, uh, both of you in that, that it could be a, a document that could use one of the two documents to be used to establish uh, the proper address of the voters, and then you continue vouching, and then, uh, which is the, where I want you to, to lead, find a more appropriate method for balancing the constitutional right of eligible Canadians to vote with the re very remote risk of voter fraud. Um, I, I, I want to stress that the uh, uh, Chief Electoral Officer in his uh, statement in the House of Commons has mentioned that, that there are under 20,000 people in his, in his books uh, who use vouching uh, in the last election. And he said on none of the case there were appearance of fraud. Uh, vouching to me is, a, is really the last resource of identification. Uh, and the number shows it, you know, there are eight, eight millions and more Canadians voting and, and there are only uh, under 20,000. The problem is not the number, the problem is the people. You know, you and me have a driving license, we have a lot of proof that uh, we live in that address or not. But unfortunately, not all Canadians drive a car. Unfortunately, not all Canadians can prove easily because they are not highly educated as you are that they live at such an address or they have an address uh, that is very well identified. And we have to be concerned with those peoples. That's why we, we are the Senate. If there is an, a, a utility for this institution, is essentially to ask for what is the impact of this bill on Canadians who can't, at first sight, come within the general framework whereby the majority of Canadians are. That's why we have a democracy that seems to be uh, humane, in a way, concerned with those who don't answer the rules of everybody. So it seems to me that the vouching system is an alternative for that. If somebody proves to me that it is uh, an entrance door to fraud or, or change of election results in a way that it steals election, I would say, okay, let's look into it. None of the witnesses have been able to show that to us. So if it is a system whereby a Canadian who cannot provide the documentation that you have in your pocket and I have in mine, well then I would say before putting a cross on it or throw it in the basket, I would want to know if there is a better alternative than vouching to protect those, the, the rights of those people to vote. Because those are the ones that are more vulnerable. Those are the ones that are less educated and so on. And we have to be concerned about those peoples. As, I, as you said, well, I don't think that Section 3 put a qualification on the status of the person who vote. That person might vote for all kinds of wrong reasons, in my own opinion and in yours. But nevertheless, that person has the right to be wrong and to vote for the wrong reasons. We all know that. But that's not the philosophy of the system. 
the, the objective of the system is to allow some person to participate in voting because in participating in voting, it's part of the Canadian society. That's essentially what it is. So my questions on, on you said, uh, and I don't want to lecture you either. Uh, <laughs> is there going to be an exam? That's what yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, What do you have in mind as a more appropriate you, you, let, method? Let me quickly go through a, a, a few points. There, there should be far more emphasis on the front end of the process of ensuring that the registration is kept up to date and that uh, there are a few inaccuracies in it. Uh, and the UK is going to online registration and online voter authentication. Mm. And, and that will reduce the risks at, on voting day, which is a hectic period of time with a lot of volunteers in charge. Mm. Second point I'd make, the problem, as everyone knows, is not so much proving your identity, it's the address requirement. Yes. In Manitoba, I think it's a model to be looked at. In Manitoba, you uh, appear at the polling station. You have two pieces of identification, neither of which contains an address. You're not forced to go home or to find someone to vouch for you. You do, co do what's called declaration voting. You declare that you are who you say on your card and that you live within the polling division, within the constituency with that where you're being asked to cast the vote. I would, If there was more time for this process, uh, if the government and the Parliament take more time, you'd be looking at the UK development where they're developing a more balanced and principled proportionate approach to the potential of voter misrepresentation. It's not demonstrated. Look at what in Australia, the national level and in all six states, they've had declaration voting until this year when Queensland became the only state to now have photo ID but not an address requirement. And they, they did that on the grounds to reassure the public, not because, and they say directly in black and white, that we have found absolutely no evidence of voter fraud. But we've had criticism, and to assure the public that there's integrity in the electoral process, we are adopting this. So I'm saying if this went for the courts, I am not speaking, I'm not a lawyer, you would have to address the question of proportionality. Is this a, a, a restriction that meets the, the uh, requirement for proportional restrictions based on uh, the risk of voter fraud? I'll stop there. Okay.